All right. <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about breast pathology in depth. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the uh, visual summary of all the locations of breast lesions that are going to be discussed today. And this is right from first aid. And as we're going through it, we're going to be we're going to have this diagram on each slide so that we can localize where each of these pathologies occur, just so we can kind of visualize where they should be happening. Okay. So we have fibrocystic changes, and uh, this is the most common cause of breast lumps in females between the ages of 25 years old and menopause. And this is also known as proliferative breast disease. So in the diagram, uh, this mass normally sticks to the terminal duct area. So right here is where we're normally going to be seeing fibrocystic changes. So it normally presents with premenstrual breast pain and usually resolves after the period is over. Uh, so this condition tends to go away with menopause because it is associated with menstrual activity. These lumps can be bilateral and often fluctuate in size in sync with cyclic menstrual activity. So uh, these diseases are pretty much benign and they are not associated with cancer. And the histological change that can occur with this is dysplasia. So we've also, now we've got, <clears throat> sorry, uh, sclerosing adenitis, which occurs in the lobal stroma. Back, back here and uh, is associated with calcifications. So the main thing you need to know about this guy is there is a slight increase in cancer. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so epithelial hyperplasia is in the terminal duct lobular unit. Let's see there and over here. <clears throat> and uh, it can be associated with carcinoma if there are atypical cells. And for some reason, the image did not show up here, so whatever. Okay, so before I move on to the next page, let's just... <clears throat> so we've got fibrocystic changes. So if you're going to get a question on your test, it's probably going to be fibrocystic changes. It's most common premenopausal, and the, the sexy question here is that <clears throat> patient's going to come in and say something like, oh, my breasts get really tender and swollen during my period. So that's the uh, takeaway point here, and the fact that it's bilateral is uh, another big clue for you. Um, <clears throat> so um, in this slide, that's the one that's most important in benign fibrocystic changes. And then uh, this guy is just associated with cancer, and this guy associated with cancer, which is based on where their locations are. Okay. <clears throat> so next up, um, we have fat necrosis. So, it's most commonly a cause. It's most commonly associated with trauma, and uh, this one happens in the uh, the anterior portion of our diagram, in the lactiferous sinus and the major ducts. Um, so the trauma doesn't have to be major. Even jogging with an adequate support or a seatbelt pull could be enough to cause it. It's usually painless and benign, but can calcify and cause a lot of concern if it's picked up on a mammogram and also can cause concern if uh, a patient you know feels the lump and they'll say doc I feel a lump so 
this could be one of those situations where you have to reassure the patient that everything's okay. We have lactational mastitis, and they brought this shit up on the radio the other day because one of the radio hosts is just had a baby, so she's like breast pumping in the studio. And she said that she had mastitis. Oh, okay, yeah. Let, let's talk about how. Let, let's actually, I'm going to talk about mastitis, and then I'm going to talk about what they were talking about. Okay, so lactational mastitis is a breast abscess which is filled with cloudy yellow fluid that occurs during breastfeeding, most commonly caused by staph aureus. And since we're going to, it's um, in the anterior portion as well, and it's going to be normally in the lactiferous sinus or in the duct. Um, Patient will complain of red, swollen, tender, and warm breasts to the touch, and treatment is to continue breastfeeding. Do not stop. Some students find it hard to grasp the concept of just letting the baby continue to drink milk that is tainted with staph aureus. But the truth is that if mom decides to stop feeding, then the infection can get worse because it's now stagnant within the ducts and can fester and actually ascend posteriorly. And some people might ask, well, what about the baby? And you're thinking, well, if you're giving this baby staph aureus milk, it's going to get um, unhealthy. Well, the thing is that mom's breast milk is packed with IgAs, and the IgAs in the milk will surround the breast cells. Because remember, they, they help provide protective coating in mucosal surfaces. So they're going to provide a protective coat around the uh, the staph aureus in the milk, and it's going to protect the baby. Um, okay, so having said that, this lady was talking about mastitis, and then, uh, okay, you guys know Dak Shepard, the actor, and mm-hmm. who's his wife? Um, 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 Kristen Bell. And Bell. And so ships. apparently she recently had an interview with whoever and they had a kid not too long ago and so she's breastfeeding and she had lactational mastitis and she was no longer feeding her child but she needed to get rid of it and knew that she had to continue breastfeeding in order to do so so who decided to step up and be the hero? Dak Shepard. Yes, he apparently um, breastfed himself and then had a bucket next to him and would spit out the nasty staph aureus mastitis infected uh, milk products. So, yeah. I um, saw this interview actually. It's for, well, there you go. It's for her new show. And she was explaining that this was her third time getting mastitis and that they couldn't get to a doctor and. She was like, well, they're going to have to suck this out for me. So that's what happened. Yeah, so hopefully that was enjoyable. Um, okay, so any questions on fat necrosis or lactational mastitis? As far as the Wait, so wouldn't the guy be more, like, susceptible to getting it? He was spitting I it out, know. though. Mm. He was drinking spitting out. But again... Uh, still be protected. Exactly. The IgAs are in the milk. So the IgAs will coat the staph aureus. If this is the staph aureus, you're going to have the IgAs surrounding okay. it completely and rendering it um, unable to... It won't have any attachment sites to bind to mucosal surfaces. Because you're worried, oh, baby's going to get... Or Dak Shepard is going to get some kind of GI manifestation or something. But if all the binding sites are completely um, uh, bound up by IgAs, then you don't have a problem. Make sense? Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so as far as fat necrosis and lactational mastitis go, these are actually pretty... If you get one of these, you hope you get one of these questions because they're clear-cut. This one... 
red, swollen, tender breast. Mom should continue feeding and just remember Staph aureus. Fat necrosis, calcification, benign calcification on on a, um, a mammogram. And the patient is probably going to be heavily breasted. And she's a jogger or was recently in a car accident with a seatbelt, um, you know, pressed up against her breast. And so, the, so the, these two are uh, more clear-cut breast pathology. Make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So now we're moving on to benign tumors of the breast. So we have fibroadenomas, which are small, mobile, firm masses that are, excuse me, they arise all the way back here in the stroma. Um, they're the most common tumor in females under 35 years old, and they are estrogen receptor positive. Uh, and so they grow and are more tender during pregnancy and menstruation. Which breast pathology did we already talk about that is estrogen receptor positive and fluctuates with the menstrual cycle? The fibro dysplasia, the fibrocystic changes? Fibrocystic changes, instant callback. So, here we have a mammogram that is showing a well circumscribed mass without calcifications. If we saw calcifications, we'd be thinking, um, was it fat necrosis? Fat necrosis, right? Um, <clears throat> what? So it would be white? Is that what we, if, we, if there was calcification? Okay, so. Like, this is like the breast tissue. You would, yeah, you'd see probably like a little white. Um, actually, do I? I think eventually I do show a breast uh, mammogram with a, ca uh, a calcification. But it would be very, very bright. And actually, oh yeah, it would be very white. Whereas this is obviously a very dark mass, and this is all the breast tissue. But if you had a calcification like over here, this area would be like completely white. Okay. And like, so this again, is considered dense tissue, the yeah. darkness? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a well circumscribed mass without calcifications, aka fibroadenoma. So. What's important to realize is that this is not a precursor to breast cancer and do not increase a woman's risk for breast cancer. So um, when you see that on a question, on a test, the problem is that it's going to be difficult for you to answer and tell a patient that the answer is reassurance and no further testing, treatment, or monitoring is needed. So that's the difficult aspect of the fibroadenoma. Because you feel it, it again, it increases in time, and you see it on a mammogram. But you have to be like, lady, calm down, you're going to be fine. So uh, we've got intraductal papilloma next. Sorry, I have one quick question. Yeah, yeah please, let's um, do it. What would, what would be their symptom manifestations in a fibroadenoma? Just a um, palpable mass? And it would, okay, so the difference between this and, let's say, fibrocystic changes, like we've talked about earlier, they're both going to be tumors that you're going to feel uh, alongside your menstrual cycle. Um. But the difference here is that fibroadenoma is going to show up on mammogram and uh, fibroadenoma is not typically bilateral, whereas fibrocystic changes are typically bilateral. Okay, got it. That's the difference. Because again, difference it, again let's, let's, let's look at this. We're, look, we're talking about tumors now. And a tumor, by definition, is just a mass. It doesn't matter if it's water, solid, fluffy, calcium, doesn't matter. 
a tumor is a mass, whereas fibrocystic changes is quote unquote a lump, but it's not necessarily like a mass. It's the tissue itself is changing. The fibro tissues are changing, not necessarily creating a mass, but it feels like a lump. That's just it reacting to tissue. But this, as you can see, is like you said, Tulsi is creating a dense mass. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. So, intraductal papillomas are small tumors that grow in the lactiferous duct. So... In this area, we got introductal papilloma right down here. Um, and you will often find them just beneath the areola. That makes sense if we're talking about this area here. Um, this is the most common cause of serous or bloody discharge from the nipple. And they are associated with a slight increase in risk for breast cancer, so they're a bit more of concern than a fibroadenoma. So, if you see discharge from a patient's nipple that isn't milk, this is your first differential intraductal papilloma. Most common cause for nipple discharge. Makes sense. We're talking about a pathology that is right behind the areola, so we're talking near the nipple, so if you have some kind of serosanguinous fluid or something backing up and it comes out, then that's, it's, you know, um, closest root of escape. So anything that isn't milk, so blood, if it's something that's, I, I know I've heard the term straw-colored appearance is another one. So anything... Um, Exuding from the breast is introductal papilloma until proven otherwise. And then we've got phylloides too. So, oh, this is the large and bulky tumor that uh, is made of connective tissue and cysts. They occur later in life, typically in the 60s. And on histology, you'll see what they call leafy projections. I don't know if they're that leafy, but... Maybe a four leafy clover. Um, so they do have a greater risk for malignant transformation, greater risk for malignant transformation than intraductal papillomas. And phylloides tumors happen back here in the stroma as well. And I'm sure, I think it was in our, I just remember this photo, I think it was from the, um, 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 Dr. Zane's class, where you see a female. And she has one breast, and the other one is, you know, this massive pendulum thing. You guys have seen that photo before? Yeah. Yes. Like, these are very obvious. Uh, they can be unilateral, and, you know, they're heavy and nasty. And, um, so, yeah. So, again... Aside from fibroadenoma, which you have to distinguish this one from fibrocystic changes, these three are actually uh, pretty unique in their own way. Fibroadenoma, again, this one is a mass that can be seen on mammogram that fluctuates with your menstrual cycle because it is estrogen receptor positive. Introductal papilloma has to do with fluid discharge that is not milk, serous, or bloody. And phylloides tumor is the big, bulky tumor. And on this particular page, as we move down the column, they get more and more associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, although these are still benign tumors. Any questions on this page? Nope. All right. Let's continue on. So, we're going to chat about gynecomastia. And this is the 
um, growth of breast tissue in males in response to hyperestrogenism. Excuse me. There are many causes of gynecomastia, but you have to put drug side effects on the top of your list. And a great mnemonic for drug-induced gynecomastia is some dope drugs will easily create awkward, hairy, double-D <coughs> knockers. If you ever want to remember that. So, drugs that can cause it. We got spironolactone, dope, marijuana, although in my opinion, I have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, you got digitalis, estrogen, obviously, cymetidine, alcohol, heroin, dopamine, D2 antagonists, and ketoconazole. Um, so otherwise, gynecomastia occurs in high estrogen states like cirrhosis, puberty, old age, and Klinefelter syndrome. And it has been seen as perineoplastic syndrome in large cell bronchogenic carcinoma. Um, and I remember, um, 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 Golion Audio, he said there are three times in life that men get gynecomastia. When they're newborn babies, when they're teenagers, and when they become old men. And then he says, I'm on the third part of that one. Um, and actually, I have felt gynecomastia on patients and just like he said it really you really do have to feel it because it, it it doesn't again feels like breast tissue on a man and it isn't like fat it is uh, very very soft <clears throat> and um so the question that i have seen typically about gynecomastia if it doesn't relate if it's not any of the drug things, I've typically seen it. And actually, it's probably because I was doing the peds questions in New World. But it, it normally shows up with a boy coming in age 14, 15, whatever kid in high school comes in. And he says, one of my breasts is large. I'm getting breast cancer. And the, the pediatrician will feel it. And it'll be something like this, where it's very loose, not fluffy, soft tissue. And the physician just says, dude, it's fine. It'll go away within a couple of years. By the time you finish puberty, it'll be done. Because um, uh, gynecomastia, especially in the teenage years, is very frequently unilateral. So that's why boys will get freaked out because they think they got cancer, but it's just lateral gynecomastia. Any question? And as far as this ridiculous mnemonic, which you will never remember, because that's too much to remember, the big players are spironolactone, I don't know why, but this always ends up on tests, uh, alcohol, the estrogen, obviously, if you're going to have uh, some kind of estrogen replacement therapy or they have some kind of need for estrogen replacement therapy and ketoconazole. Those are the big ones that I've seen, but mainly it's been spironolactone due to its anti-androgen effects. Okay. So now I'm moving on to malignant tumors. Okay. Okay, so uh, quick background, we know breast cancer is the most common cause of cancer in females, and it usually arises from the terminal breast ducts. Uh, they most commonly occur after menopause, and the hormone sensitivity of breast cancer plays a major role in the characterization of these tumors. The most important receptors are those of estrogen, progesterone, and the EGF family, herb B2, and overexpression of estrogen progesterone receptors, or herb B2, can actually dramatically change the treatment and prognosis. So, for example, if we have breast cancer that is estrogen-receptive, estrogen-receptor 
positive, then it may respond to selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen. Um, so, okay, so the point here is, is that if you have estrogen, um, progesterone, and HER2 new negative breast cancers, they're much more aggressive because we don't have any specific targets to attack this breast cancer with. So that's why you want, you know, you're actually happy that you, oh, your, your, your breast cancer is progesterone receptor positive. We have something to target. or HER2 new positive. We can give you transfusion now. So um, we want uh, those to be around. Um, okay. All right. So what is the most important prognostic factor of malignant breast tumors? Metastasis. Hmm? Metastasis. Metastasis. Metastasis, yes. So if the cancer is made to the axillary lymph nodes, this indicates metastasis. Um, and what is the most common location of a breast cancer? Upper outside. Upper outer quadrant, correct. So we have several risk factors, most dealing with increased estrogen exposure, longer reproductive time periods, increased peripheral conversion, adipose, BRCA1, BRCA2, African-American ethnicity, and um, so yeah, um, African-American woman that has increased estrogen, longer cycles. Oh, yeah. Okay, increased age at first birth. So the, your fr increased age when you had your first baby. So... When they had her baby at 40 is a higher risk than someone that had it at first at 20. Okay. Oh, any questions about um, general breast tumor stuff? Okay. So now we're moving on to the malignant breast tumors. Ductal carcinoma in situ. As the name implies, it is a ductal. And it stays within the terminal duct, which means that it has not yet invaded into the basement membrane, making it treatable. That's what in situ means. It hasn't crossed past the basement membrane. So... Um, I have here, in the image you can see monomorphic neoplastic cells filling the lumen of the ducts. So that's all this red stuff in here, filling up the ducts, but not expanding past the basement membrane, so they're not spilling out past it. Uh, one major subtype of DCIS is comedocarcinoma. Next one. Yep. And is characterized by caseous necrosis and is isolated to the ducts. So, uh, micro review. What is the major lung disease you see in case you see caseous necrosis in? Lung pathology with caseous necrosis. Mm -hmm. Tuberculosis, correct. <clears throat> okay, Paget's disease. So, as we see in this image, Paget's disease looks like eczema on the nipple. You can sometimes get bloody discharge from the nipple, and if we, or if we see bloody discharge from the nipple, what should be our first differential? Um, oh, dum, dum. 
No, no, Paget. No, that's that's this one. Oh. What is your first <laughs> different? Sorry. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Intra. Intra. Papilloma. Intra. Papilloma. is your first uh, differential. I mean, obviously, if you're going to see eczema all around the nipple and there's a bloody discharge, yeah, you're going to go with Paget's. But if you see bloody or serious discharge, you're going to first think intraductal papilloma. Okay, so the large and irregular malignant cells are known as Paget's cells. And in regards to this, de- this disease, you should understand that this type of rash seen on the skin signifies that there is an underlying malignancy. It's usually DCIS. So you can get extra mammillary patch disease, which has the same histological features, but they don't suggest underlying malignancy. Um, on note, this disease has nothing to do with Paget's disease of the bone, but what extra mammillary Paget's disease might we see? And I don't think this is in first aid unless they added it this year. Also, Paget's disease of the vagina and the, the vulva, so you can actually get this on the lady's exterior. Okay, so looking at this page as a quick review, so we're talking about malignant tumors now. This is already cancer. So these all kind of happen in the posterior aspect of the breast. Ductal carcinoma in situ. We're going to have, uh, again, calcifications, but we're not going to be invading past the basement membrane. This does not happen. It stays within the confines where it's supposed to. Hasn't invaded. Comedocarcinoma has a central caseating necrosis, which is unique because you normally only hear about caseating necrosis in the lung. So if you hear caseating necrosis in the breast, comedocarcinoma. And there you go. C and a C, comedocarcinoma, you can think caseating. And central. Look at all those Cs. And then Paget's disease, eczema, overlying the breast, and, oh, I'm sorry, overlying the nipple specifically. And uh, this is indicative of an underlying DCIS. Any questions on these two? Okay. Oh, okay, so these are the Paget cells. So, large cells with clear halos. That's what you see on histology. Okay. So now we already talked about Gulfdale carcinoma in situ, where it didn't pass through the basement membrane. Now we've got invasive duct. Yeah, invasive ductal carcinoma, which is when it invades past the basement membrane. So these tumors tend to be firm, rock-hard mass with well-defined margins. And you can see there's going to be stippling of the skin or bloody nipple discharge. Um, Okay, so again, we have bloody nipple discharge. What are we first thinking about? Intraductal papilloma. Correct. Intraductal papilloma. So these guys make up about three quarters of breast cancers. Um, Okay. So these well-defined masses have characteristic duct-like cells on histology. Um, and although it is the most common tumor, it also has the worst prognosis. So, not very good. Alright. We have next invasive lobular carcinoma, 
which occurs in the breast lobule, which also the uh, invasive ductal carcinoma obviously does as well. Um, and the cancer cells form these lines, rows of cells. And um, I'm actually, I think they used to call them Indian row cells. Indian files. Indian file lines, yeah, that's right. Um, but the key factor to remember about the lobular cancers is that they are often bilateral. What other tumor did we talk about that is frequently bilateral? I'll give you a hint. It was the first breast pathology we discussed. Fibrocystic changes? Fibrocystic changes are also often bilateral. Good. So, the, the um, um, so the difference here would be that A, one is malignant, and B, on this has a very distinct histology, these Indian file lines or whatever. Okay, speaking of female tumors, do you remember which ovarian tumors are often bilateral? Wow, why didn't I put that? Okay, don't answer that. The answer is serious cystadenomas and cystadenocarcinomas. I don't know why I did that throwback or callback. Okay, any questions on these two? So invasive ductal carcinoma, things to remember about this guy is that it is rock-hard mass, the most common breast cancer, and you're going to have skin dimpling. And, I mean, it's, it's going to be a pretty obvious mass here. And remember that since it's invasive, it has bleached through the basement membrane. Um, and then... Her lobular is in lines, and it is often bilateral, and you get these single file Indian file cells. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so now we've got medullary carcinoma. Medullary carcinoma. It accounts for about 5% of breast cancers, and it typically occurs in younger women. They are characterized by fleshy cellular lymphocytic infiltrates, and they have a very good prognosis so that you can remember that they have the breast prognosis. Hardy, 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 hard. Um... Okay, so this is the lymphocytic infiltrates that you can see all around here. It's dark purple stuff. Um, okay, that's all I have for that one. Then inflammatory breast cancer has a poor prognosis with a 50% five-year survival rate. It may resemble Paget's disease in terms of presentation. However, if the question is about inflammatory breast cancer, the question stem will often describe skin changes, in particular changes resembling peau d'orange or uh, skin of the appeal of the orange. As we can see here, there is skin dimpling and some recedings over here. Um, meaning orange peel. The skin changes are caused by blockage of the lymphatic ducts. And the reason you see the dimples are because the Cooper's ligaments that attach memory glands to the overlying dermis, excuse me, are, are, um, uh, are being pulled up because of the tissue swelling. Okay, so medullary carcinoma has a good prognosis and it's fleshy, cellular. Um, I, I highly doubt questions like 
this would come up because it's not unless they put lymphocytic infiltrates. I doubt that you would see a question on that. But inflammatory breast cancer is uh, probably going to be a good one, only because you have this dimpling. So they could say code orange as a buzzword. They could want you to know that it's an inflammatory process, meaning that there's lymphatic invasion. Or they might want to tell you the mechanism of the podor orange, which is the Cooper's ligaments being yanked up due to the swelling. Make sense? Or, I mean, not make sense, but do, do you appreciate the differences or the unique aspects? Mm -hmm. Okay. What histologic finding indicates spread of a breast cancer past just the primary site? I should have said just past the primary site. Past the site? Okay. Two cells and accident cells. Okay. So now to do a review, we have this Google reference. Big yeah, there we go. Let's do that. Yeah, I see that just fine? Mm-hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, actually, Divya, you wanna you wanna walk us through this since it's yours, and I'll uh, I'll just scroll down whenever you're ready. So this is just kind of a summary of the key differences and most important characteristics of the breast masses. Um, starting with the benign breast masses, we have our fibroadenoma here, and our key things we want to note for this guy is that it's usually going to be a small, well-defined, mobile mass. Um, and on histology, which I included a little image there, you're going to see fibrosing stroma around normal glandular tissue. And um, to keep note of any risks or complications for this guy, there's really no increased risk of cancer development. And some other notes for fibroadenomas, you'll typically see it in women under the age of 35. And again, um, it'll change in size and tenderness with menstruation since it is estrogen sensitive. What's the other one that's estrogen sensitive? Fibrocystic changes. Fibrocystic changes. Good. Hey, let's keep doing this. I need this too. Let's keep doing it. And uh, then we have our introductal papilloma. And on presentation, this guy will be a small papillary tumor within the electiferous ducts. And on histology or in questions, you can see it being described as branching fibrovascular cores extending from a dilated duct. So we're going to see. Let me explain that. You'll have a dilated duct and then you'll have branches of fibrovascular cores coming out of there. You can kind of see it there in the image. Um, and this one does have an increased risk of cancer, about one and a half to two times there. And again, is the most common cause of nipple discharge. Keep in mind. And then the last one on our benign breast masses section is Phyllodes tumor. Um, this one presents as a large mass of connective tissue and cysts. <coughs> and there are leaf-like lobulations. I didn't include a picture here, but um, it will supposedly look like a leaf that extends out from the lobule. And these guys can become malignant and um, are most common over the age of 50. And, yeah. and then we have our malignant breast masses, starting with the non-invasive types. 
we have our ductal carcinoma in C2, and this presents as monomorphic neoplastic cells within the ductal lumen. And there's no basement penetration here. Um, and you can see microcalcifications on mammogram. And um, important to know that this can arise from ductal atypia. So you start having some um, cellular changes going on in your ducts, it can progress to this. And then we have comatocarcinoma. Um, this will present with central caseous necrosis that's isolated to the ducts. And um, note that it's a subtype of ductal carcinoma in C2. And then we have Paget's disease, um, and this will present with eczematous patches on the nipple, like we saw earlier, and um, histologically we'll see Paget cells, which can be described as intraepithelial large cells with clear halos, being a little buzzword there. And you can get bloody discharge with this guy as well. And um, this can also arise from an underlying DCIS or an invasive breast cancer as well. Yeah, so these are the little, oh, never mind, my pen doesn't work here. <laughs> the little passage cells here, these little white guys. Yeah. And then we scroll all the way down to our invasive malignant breast tumors, we have invasive ductal carcinoma, and these will present as fine, fine, firm, fibrous, hard masses with very sharp margins. Um, they can be seen as small glandular duct-like cells. You see like kind of these white clearings with spaces around them. That's kind of where your duct-like cells look like. You'll see skin dimpling here, and I'll explain the difference between the skin dimpling you see here and in the other one we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and you'll also see stellate infiltration with your cells. And this guy, since it's invasive, will invade your basement membrane. You'll also see bloody nipple discharge. And then, um, it can be described in a question as sheets of pleomorphic cells infiltrating adjacent stroma. So it's just a little phrase you can try to remember, maybe, maybe not. And important to know that this is the most common of all breast cancers. I believe Pete, you said 75%? Correct. And then we have our invasive lobular carcinoma. This is the one that presents as, um, a single file row of cells. And important to know that um, this will present as multiple bilateral lesions. And um, the histology can be described as parallel arrays of small monomorphic cells with scant cytoplasm. Basically saying that they're in parallel, they're in these rows of cells with very, very tiny cells that don't have a lot of cytoplasmic space. And then we have medullary carcinoma, and really the only thing of note here is to remember that it presents as a fleshy cellular lymphocytic infiltrate. And then last, we have inflammatory breast cancer. Um, this one has a dermal lymphatic invasion and uh, can present with a pure de orange skin um, and can often be mistaken for mastitis or Paget's disease. Um, and this skin presentation for this guy versus the invasive ductal carcinoma um, is the whole de orange appearance. Here it'll be more uniform, just like the little 
dots or little slight dimples that you see on the skin of an orange versus um, when you have the um, lymphatic drainage blockage and the Cooper's ligaments being pulled, you'll see a more dramatic dimpling going on, which you'll see in both cases, both here for inflammatory breast cancer as well as invasive ductal carcinoma. The only difference is that here you'll also see the little, the smaller dimplings that look like an orange peel, if that clears that up a little. Yes. And that's all. Yes. Yeah. Mm.